got mail. Cruising down the street on my lawnmower. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have been, we started uh, last week, Brian started talking about digital Babylon, and uh, I have to admit that um, I'm being away for a week, and just to let you know, I was gone in Maine and New Hampshire, mostly in Maine, as Joni and I were celebrating our 40th anniversary. So uh, we had a great time, and uh, thank you, I appreciate it. I knew you'd be nice and applaud. As I told someone that, you know, uh, she, she robbed the cradle, she married me when I was two, and uh, somebody said, ah, you can't get away with that. Maybe 15, but you know, not, okay. So, uh, but it's been great and, and we had a great time. And one of the things I was reminded of as we were up there and as we were traveling is I can't go anywhere without, are you that way too? In fact, when I didn't have this with me, if I forgot it and left it in the uh, bed and breakfast or the hotel room, you know, you feel sort of naked, don't you? Or like, oh, what am I going to do? When Brian was talking about that the iPhone came out in 2007, we were researching uh, for the last couple of months, and it was one of the things when that came, when I read that, I said, that's not true. Are you serious? 2007? No, we've had it a lot longer than that. Do you feel that way? I mean, it just seems like I can't think of how to live or how to work or how to do things without this. And I'm, I'm a real um, keep up with my stuff person. In fact, if I, if I ever take you to the airport, one of the things that you'll find, I've always done this, is I will say, okay, you got your ticket, you got your uh, wallet, you've got your, uh, as people get in the car, because I don't want to have to turn around and come back and go, oh, no. And I didn't do it one time, and my son, as we got to the airport, said, my wallet. <laughs> And uh, so since then, I've always done it. Now, you know, the first thing I ask, have you got your, yeah, you got your cell phone, you got your wallet, you got your ticket, because without this, I think, you know, you're not going to make it. You're going to have a difficult time. Got on the airplane. Uh, we're on United. And uh, as we're on United, one of the things I learned now is when you're on United, if you want a snack or anything like that, you can't get it without you, cash. They don't take it. Credit card, they don't take it. You have to have this, and it have to have, has to have the app from United loaded, and you have to have loaded the credit card information into the app before you get on the plane or you can't get anything. And there are a lot of hungry people mad with cash waving it and credit cards, and they couldn't get anything. And thank goodness my wife knows, and she loaded it. So I was like, I'm not sharing, you know, because uh, <laughs> it's a funny world, isn't it? While we're up there, we're driving, and one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes GPS is not reliable. Have you noticed that? And we're going down the highway, and uh, it does one of those funny things. All of a sudden, you know, I know where we're going. I think we've got another 20-something miles before we turn off, and it says, take this right. In fact, I've learned, you know, when the British lady comes on and talks on GPS, if she says, um, resume course or get on the route, that means she doesn't know where you are. That's what I've learned. And so we turn right, and we go through this town in Maine, this little town, and we're kind of weaving through and turn left and on one-way streets. And 20 minutes later, it, she brings us back to the highway where we were to resume our trip. And I'm like, what was that all about? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Pulled into Rockport, Maine. If you've ever been to Rockport, Maine, and as we're going down, Joni says, it says, turn right right here. And I'm like, well, I can see the town. I mean, it's right down there. It says turn right right here. As I turn right, it says dead end street. It's about 50 yards long, and it leads into the bay, and there are some nice houses there. It says dead end, no turnaround. You go down this street, and then you have to back up in the street and maneuver and turn back around. As you come back around, somebody has been so smart because they understand, and there's a sign there. This is, I know you're looking for Rockport, Maine. <laughs> you will soon be there. <laughs> It's not very far, and you will love it. By the way, your GPS is wrong, and it leads everybody down this street. And I'm like, oh, man. You know, that's just the way it happens. Uh, my four-year-old granddaughter, I was reading a book 
And my four-year-old granddaughter can do exactly what the book was talking about. It says kids today can swipe like nobody's business, right? I mean, she can take a phone when she was four. She could swipe up and down. She can't read, but she can operate this thing. I, when I first got my, this is an X, and when I first got this, you know, it took me a couple days because it messed me all up because I kept saying, where is the button? Did you do that? There's no button on the phone. How can you operate a phone with no button? It all, it all goes to, uh, to illustrate the point that technology has changed, hasn't it? In fact, it's changed uh, everything. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this series is because sometimes it's difficult to maneuver through life with new technology and to figure out what does that mean? Is the technology bad? Is it evil? Is the technology good? How do you work your way uh, through it? And how does one generation deal with the next generation? Because technology has changed us um, as a culture uh, because of the rapid growth of that technology. In fact, uh, I did put this in your outline, a couple of things, uh, just kind of statements uh, in there. There, one of them goes, maybe, nope, not going to pop. There it is. Every new age brings both benefits and, say it with me, yeah, challenges. Man, it's a challenge. It's hard to figure out this, this new age and, and the difficulty of, of going through it. I'm standing in Starbucks line. So I'm in a little town, let's see, I was in Portland, Maine, standing in Starbucks, and there's a man behind me, a retired gentleman and his wife, and his phone keeps ringing and beeping and going off, and I'm looking behind me, and he's going, I think he was doing like, Martha, you know, what, you know, <laughs> what is this thing? To, and he's going, and, it, and it's just kind of like driving me crazy. And, and he is kind of oblivious to the fact there are other people in this line. And then as I go and I sit down at a uh, more of a bistro start table waiting for my order, he's supposed to be next in line. And he's oblivious to the lady working there trying to take his order because it's still beeping and making noises. And he's still going like this. And I'm saying, I say, kids, you know, you know, because <laughs> it feels like that, doesn't it? You get older and all of a sudden it feels like, I don't know how to operate this. The new generation does. My, my kids, they know how to deal with this, but I have no idea. So I did put, I put this in your outline also. The rapid growth of technology um, has, the, our technological change has created a much larger gap between the generations. It has. Um, it's, it's, it's more difficult for us to relate to one another. And it's more difficult for us to understand one another because there's, there are generations now who have grown up and they have never known life without this. In fact, one of the new generations is called the Z generation. So if you were born in 1995 or after, somewhere in that range is what is called the Z generation. I, I particularly, particu I like in particular the... Uh, the book that a, a lady out of San Diego State has written, um, I, I'm going to mispronounce her last name so someone can help me for the next service. Her name is Jean, T-W-E-N-G-E. -E. Would that be twinge or twingy? Okay, nobody's going to try it. Okay, so I don't know. But anyway, she's out of San Diego State. She's been doing research um, since her uh, PhD, and so she's got about 30 years of research into generational changes, and she's written this book. I would highly recommend it. It's called iGen. And um, in her book, she describes the changes that have gone on. And listen, I, I know some people are not going to like this. But as she describes the changes, she describes the dangers of the changes with a new generation. And I, I think they're kind of twofold. Um, the dangers of thinking somehow that, that this has made life different than the lives of all people that came before us. And it has made us smarter and better and more adequate, that's a, that's a danger, but also a danger of the generations that have come before them, including, including mine, who somehow say, I don't know how to deal with this, so I'm not going to try, and I'm just going to kind of dismiss it and act as if, like I said, kids who are retired, and, you know, so, you know, because you don't know how to deal with it, and in that way, not jump in and try to help and try to help uh, a new generation find their way because the new generation is like all generations equipped with some really important characteristics some real gifts uh, some approaches that are really wonderful and fresh and new but also some struggles uh, and some dangers and so early on in her book she does a lot of um, 
interviews. So one of the uh, little girls that she interviews, I say little girl, teenager, uh, her name is uh, Athena. And uh, here's a paragraph that she writes about Athena in a talk she had with her after her summer. She said, Athena says she spent most of the summer hanging out by herself in her room with her phone. I, I would rather, this is Athena speaking, I would rather be on my phone in my room watching Netflix than spending time with my family. Whew. And so it's a different generation, right? And I know you think, well, when I was, you know, maybe in junior high, I liked a lot of alone time also. But then she adds this later on. She says, this is Athena. She says, I think we, my generation, we like our phones more than we like actual people. <laughs> now, I know you might think, well, I'm kind of like that, and maybe. Uh, my sister, when uh, my, my mom uh, and dad were in science, and so my dad was a, a doctor, and I still remember when we all went that route, my sister decided to be a vet instead. And so if you ask her, why do you want to be a vet rather than working, you know, at a hospital or as a doctor or something like that, she said, well, animals are a lot easier to get along with, right? And uh, they are, but you have to get along with people. You have to learn how to get along with people. Um, you have to work at it, and it, it is a struggle. And, and the technology is wonderful. It has a lot of, 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 of good things about it. I, I will tell you that even as I did research on this, I use my iPhone a lot, looking up all sorts of things quickly, definitions, statistics, things like that, knowing also that I better be careful about where I got those from because they're not all trustworthy, and that's part of the problem with the technology. You can pull up a lot of stuff, and the question is, do you know that this, that this information is actually reliable um, where before you, you, know, you would look to trusted sources? And the Internet's not always a, a trusted source. I was reading an article that said in 2019, October 2019, a study was done, and the top 20 Christian American websites that people went to, of the top 20 that people went to in October of 2019, 19 of the 20 were fake. 19 of the 20 top websites that Christians went to to look up things or to find information or to get their devotions, 19 of 20 were fake. They were called troll sites. They were all created by people in other countries outside of our country. They would rob and steal content from Christian sites, post these, make it work so that you were even more attracted to them, only then to work in certain propaganda and ideas and things really kind of to divide. And they all came out of other countries in the world. And they were uh, put on uh, uh, up for uh, Christians in the United States. Guidepost was the only legitimate site of the top 20 a legitimate Christian site. So it, it just means that, you know, you, you live in a world that you don't know exactly what you're reading or what you're seeing, and how do you know that you can trust it? And it is, it is part of the uh, information struggle um, that you and I have and as we go through uh, things. There's a guy named Kerry Newhoff. He's a, uh, you may not know who he is, but he was a pastor in uh, Canada. And he had this quote, and I, I, I thought I'd jump on this one with you as we look at this. Here's his quote. Um, he says, change, <clears throat> think about this, change is unkind to the unprepared. He said, so prepare. Now think about it for a minute. Change is unkind to the unprepared. And most of us would say, well, that, but that's the problem, right? Because change, how do you prepare for change? How do you, how do you get ready for things that you don't know how they're going to change? I, I love the quote because you could put anything in there. I, I would say, uh, I told someone a couple of weeks ago, the, the platform or the stage or the pulpit is unkind to the unprepared. I use the same quote. I just changed it. It is. If you're unprepared, you're not going to do well up here. You might say in your, in your profession, you know, I know people here who are professionals, and they, you might say, this profession is unkind to the, say it with me, to the what? Unprepared. You could say about marriage, couldn't you? Marriage is unkind to the what? Say it with me again. Yeah, the unprepared. If you're a teacher, <laughs> the place in front of the uh, chalkboard, or do they have chalkboards anymore? Or the white marker board. Okay, the white marker board or where you project or something like that. that. That place where you have maybe a lectern or something, that place is unkind to the who? Unprepared. 
Parenting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you say, I know you're, you're like me. You say, yeah, but how do you prepare? All right. Some of it is you're going to learn on the spot. There's some on-the-job training that you, know, that you have to go through. But it is unkind to the unprepared. And the question is, how do you prepare in life? How are you going to deal with the changes that come in life, the things that you are going to, you're going to struggle with, and, and you need someone or some source that is both kind or compassionate, but the compassion of that source is also truthful, right? Even when that, that truth might seem to be unkind or uncompassionate, you realize that you need a balance in between in, in, in those. Because it's easy to raise a generation, it's easy to be a generation that says, I only want to hear what I want to hear. I only want people to deal with me in a way that I want to be dealt with. Or maybe here, let me go and pick it one. I only want to be dealt with in a way that builds me up, that strengthens me. Well, listen, if you're going to be built up and strengthened, you have to be challenged sometimes. Challenge and confrontation is not the same thing as criticism where someone is tearing you down. Challenge and confrontation many times is how we grow and how we learn and how we're pushed and how we actually are able to look at some things and say, I used to think this was true, now I realize it's not true, so I'm going to change what I do because this is not true, right? And so you, you need that challenge in life, and it's one of the, uh, the, the, the requirements if you're going to parent well of being a parent. I, I was just reading a, uh, a new study that came out, and uh, it's, it's uh, just like the old studies that came out. They talk about parenting styles. And once again, uh, without any question, the number one effective parenting style for successful kids is called authoritative, authoritative parenting. And now you think, what? And, and that offends a lot of people. But authoritative parenting, if you go scientifically, if you go Study-wise, if you go case studies, on authoritative parent, it's not authoritarian, it's authoritative. Authoritative parenting is by far, by far, the most effective parenting style. Why? Because that's what a parent is. A parent is there to help lead, guide, direct. This is how you live. This is not, this is not how you live. You don't go this way instead. And that's the point of it. And it's the point that you and I need um, in life. is something that we desperately uh, need in life. I, I can do this to kind of get away from putting pressure on myself, but in her book, on the cover of her book, she has a, a subtitle. Let me read this for you, and uh, you might not like it. It may offend you. That's okay. I can always say she wrote it. I didn't. Uh, this is what she says. I, I Jen, she says, uh, why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, good thing, Less rebellious, more tolerant, but less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. Wow. And this is from, this is from research. This is from scientific studies. She works out of San Diego State. And this is not based on any sort of uh, uh, pattern or philosophical idea or political idea. She's just working off of statistics and off of interviews and off of of data. And one of the things that, that bothers her, and I think it should, it bothers me also, is she says the iGen, the new generation, is actually on average about three years behind where the generations before them were as far as maturity and the ability to deal with relationships and life. Now, that doesn't mean you give up on that generation. It just means they have a new challenge that uh, maybe the generations before them didn't have, and it also means that they need help as you go through that. And, and that's what we're designed to do. That's why we are linked together and brought together so that we can encourage one another and so that we can help one another. So here's what I want to do. I want to take you through. Brian, last week, he looked at the book of Daniel. And uh, if you know the book of Daniel, Old Testament, Daniel is the story of Israel being taken off into bondage uh, to a place called, does anybody know the name of the place? Babylon. Okay, that's where we got the title from. That's right. So they, they're taken off into Babylon. They are conquered. And as they're, they're taken off, they're, they're re-educated. So the idea that Babylon had, and, and most 
uh, mega nations, powerful nations, empires had is when they conquer a country, they take the young, the smart, before they are fully formed in their thinking, and they take them off and they re-educate them. They teach them their way, their language, their system, their values, their philosophy. And the book of, of Daniel is just such an incredible book because uh, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, as they go, there's something that they carry with them. There's something that they hold inside of them that causes them to find strength to deal with the changes that are coming. Because in Israel, you know, if, if you're an, an, a, a, a teenager in Israel and you're taken off to Babylon, Babylon is impressive. I mean, it's enormous. The, the structures, the, you know, it's, it's, it rivals absolutely Egypt, you know, in, in its heyday, in its glory day. You know, in the, in, in the Bible, there's the Tower of Babel. You can read in Genesis uh, all about it. And, and Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, they prided themselves as being the rulers of the world. I mean, and they were going to educate them in this way. And it is absolutely kind of, you know, blows you away. I would think it'd be if, if you've never been somebody taking you to Vegas, right? And you're like, wow, just look at this. Never been to Vegas. So, um, but you know, it'd be easy to be impressed and say, this is the way of life. This is the right kind of life, the kind of life that I need to learn to live. Daniel and, and all of his uh, comrades uh, are taken to Babylon to be re-educated, but they have something in them. They had this understanding of who God was, of who Yahweh was. And there was a loyalty to him. And, and, and Yahweh, it became clear with Daniel, was his anchor. It was his, his point of reference. It was his, his point of navigating through life, including in a land that he may have looked at and said, you know, I'm not so sure that, that I even like being here, but it's very different from where I came from. The, the reason I think it's so important is because that's what you and I have to do. If you're going to navigate the future, You've got to have a foundation. You've got to have a base that you've built your life on so that no matter what comes, because you don't know what's going to come, that becomes your strength to guide you through that and to work your way through it so that you can depend on it and you can build your life on it. Remember Jesus did that parable? The wise man built his house, his life upon what? Yeah, something that could hold his life, something that he could be sure of that was, it was strong enough uh, to make his life uh, secure. So I want to take you to one other passage. This is New Testament, and this is a guy named Paul in Acts uh, 17. And if you know Paul's story, uh, Paul is a guy who grew up very Jewish. He was a Pharisee. He was very religious and very much held to the law. But Paul was an angry man. And Paul did what maybe, you know, a lot of us have a tendency to fall into sometimes. He decided, I need to stomp out the opposition. I need to become a critic of everything. I need to become angry and aggressive and driving public because I will go and I will fix the world by stomping out our enemies until, until, until Paul met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And that's why Christianity is different. Because Christianity is built upon the Son of God who came, gave his life, was resurrected so that we could have a new version of life, a new idea of life, and a new satisfaction from life. You remember Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and you might have what? More abundantly. Yeah, we love that. He's not talking about how much money you make or how many cars you have or things like that. He's talking about the quality of your life, how you understand life, no matter what your state is or your socioeconomic position, that there's something there for you and something now living inside of you that changes the quality of the life that you live. And it came through Jesus Christ. And Paul's life radically changes. He gives up the old approach and the old ideas. And he takes on a new love. Paul has a new love for the world around him, for the people around him. He saw them differently. So in the book of Acts, uh, Paul has become a Christian about chapter 9 in Acts, and then you get to 17, and Paul has made his journeys. He's starting to go through the known world. So at one point, Paul goes on this journey uh, up north. So you have the Mediterranean Sea. He travels up north, and you kind of turn left. You're going you know, west, and he goes into what will eventually be called, you know, or was called Greece, because the the, the, the empire of Greece with, remember, uh, Alexander the Great, that's about 350 
B.C., and he built this huge empire that eventually was kind of absorbed into the, the Roman Empire. But as you go up above the Aegean Sea, the top part of the Mediterranean, you have these towns that, that he visits, and we actually get letters that Paul later writes to them that, that help us understand them. One's called Philippi. Paul writes this much later than this journey. He writes this while he was in jail. Then he goes to a town called Thessalonica. We get First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, Thessalonica was an interesting place because there, what Paul would do, he would only stop in towns initially that had synagogues. He would go into the synagogue, and he would preach Jesus Christ by going to the Old Testament and saying, here's the Old Testament, here's what it says, Jewish scholars and Jewish people, right? Here's what it says, and it's all pointing to Jesus Christ. And he would have converts, people who would become believers, out of those synagogues because they would look at it and say, it is, you're right, oh my. It's talking about Messiah, Savior, and he has come, he fulfills it, and th that was his approach. He goes to a place called Berea, and the reason he went to Berea, which is really interesting, was because in Thessalonica, the Jewish people in the synagogues would say, we don't care what the Old Testament says or the facts about it, we're against you. And they were much more rebellious and much more antagonistic, and they would not listen to Paul. So he leaves, he goes down to Berea, and it's, it's interesting, it says, and the Bereans were much more noble-minded. In other words, they examined the facts. So when he would present it in the synagogue, they would look at it and say, it, it's true. And it says that all different kinds of people, noble, um, poor, working class, it, it specifically points out that many uh, educated and wealthy women, it actually points that out, followed Paul's teaching, became believers and established churches there. And then he goes to this, uh, um, this uh, town that is, is really important in the Greek world, Athens. So he's now at the bottom part of Greece, and there in Athens uh, he goes in and he encounters something. Listen to this. This is what it says in verse number 16. I think you really like this. He says, uh, while Paul was waiting for them, that's the others who would be coming from Berea, uh, in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols that he saw everywhere in the city. Are there things that deeply trouble you? Anybody? Does it deeply trouble you if you see things that you know, that's not true? Does it deeply trouble you? You can raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. I want to, you know. Yes, it should be deeply troubling that you say, that's not true. Why would people believe that? Why would they hold to that? Why would they live that way? That's not a good way to live. And it bothered him because as he's in Athens, he sees all the monuments and all the temples that are built to all of these gods. And, and it, it, it really, really struck deep into Paul. And Paul decided, what can I do about this in a place like uh, Athens? Because he was not in the synagogue um, in, this, in this time. And so it says in the next verse, so he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. So he goes and he speaks in the synagogue like normal, but now he also is going to go to the, the public square because of these idols. And it says then in verse number 18, he also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. Let me tell you real quickly, the Epicureans were those who their philosophy was they weren't sure about the gods, but if there were gods, the gods were distant and you could not know them, right? So uh, it's, kind of, you know, it's kind of like the epitome of the song, you know, God's watching us from far off, but God doesn't really care how we live anyway. And the Epicurean philosophy was you needed to seek and we were made to seek pleasure and happiness in life. That was kind of the the goal of their lives. And they would try to work it out by saying, you know, don't be excessive, be kind of moderate, and overcome your fear of uh, death so that you can live a pleasurable and a uh, happy life. And that's, that's the way they saw it. And the, the Stoics uh, were a little bit different, and it's where you get the word, you know, Stoic from. Uh, they did have a belief, at least in a higher purpose, from the gods that we were kind of built to live for this, this higher purpose. So it was a much more disciplined. Um, they were much more legalistic and rule-oriented in that. So he's speaking to these two. Um, and it says, when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, listen to this. They said, what's this babbler trying to say with all these strange ideas he 
picked up. The reason it's translated picked up is because he actually uses, or they use the word, what is this seed picker doing? That's what they call it. I'm sure that was not designed to be complimentary, but they designed, they call him the seed picker. He's just picking what he likes and whatever, and it sounds strange, and we don't understand this. We've never heard stuff like this uh, before. But then he goes on to, um, it goes on to say, um, I'm lost. Somebody, okay, there it is. Uh, others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. And then 19, it says, then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, address them as follows. And the reason I think this is, is, is good for us to look at is I want you to see his approach when, when Paul deals with people who are not from his background, they're, they're not from, in, in one sense, his generation where, where he grew up, but, but he's trying to find a way to communicate with them and to reach them. And he has an approach which in some ways is very similar to Daniel's approach in the Old Testament uh, when he was in Babylon. Here's what he says. Men of Athens, Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. This is a word that, that he uses that says, I notice that you are determined to stand on religious ideas and religious principles. For them, they would describe them more philosophical, but he's, he's complimenting them. He says, I, I understand this. I see this. And, and, he, and Paul is looking for some common ground with them. He says, for as I was walking along your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. So what he's doing, he's saying, listen, I understand. You don't want to miss God. It, even with all the gods of, of Greece and all the philosophy that you espouse that may not even be attached to those gods, you realize that there's more than just what we know and who we are and what we have discovered. So you have this, this, this statue, this shrine built to the unknown God because you don't want to offend the unknown God if the unknown God is real and is, is more powerful. Does that make sense? I think that most of us would say we live that way. Even people that I know that say, no, I don't believe in a God, I'm, I'm an atheist, they, they still live that way. Because they know that, that, that sometimes things happen beyond their control, and those things might have had a cause, and I don't want to offend the one who caused those things to happen. So there's a certain fear and a certain respect that human beings carry with them for God, even though they may not even know who that God is or recognize that God. That's, that's what Paul is, is pointing uh, toward with them. And then he adds in verse 24, he said, he is the God, catch this, who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. Now, for the Epicureans, they would have loved this because they would have seen, you know, all the temples and the gods and all this as, pff, you know, it's just fluff and why do we need it? So they were like, yes, that's right. So if there's a God, he is above all of this. Clearly, he would be above all of this. How could you have a God made out of stone or a God, you know, that, that, that lives in, in just in this, in this building? And then he adds, he said, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. And this would really appeal to all of them that, that said, yeah, that's right, there are higher causes and higher purposes that we need to live for and not, you know, running around collecting food and putting it by a temple as if that God in there is going to eat the food that we gathered for him. He himself, he says, gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. You see how radical that is? He's actually not looking at God, and he's pointing out that God is not someone that, that men and women have to serve because of his needs. He's saying, no, this God is the one who has no needs. In fact, God is the one who, who serves or gives to us. Everything that we have was a gift from him. He is the, the uncaused cause. 
He is the one that created and started and was not created. Every one of us, everything that we see, everything that we can touch is created. You were created. I was created. And when I live in a way that says, nope, I don't need anybody, I'm not obligated to anybody, I'm living a lie. It's the truth. Because no matter how, you know, how I want to look at my life, I've got to go back far enough to realize it started somewhere. It was handed down from somewhere. So the things that you do, yes, you do. You work hard. You give it your best effort. But as Paul would say, but you always recognize that the only reason you live, the only reason you work, the only reason that you think and you act and you move is because there was a God who was not created and he gave you life. Everything else, everything else except for God is created. And it is the message uh, from the beginning of the Bible, and Paul is reiterating that, that same message. He says, He himself gives life and breath to everything. He satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. Verse 27, he says, His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. It's that idea that, that, that there's an imminentness to God as well as a transcendence to God, that, that he is close, he wants to know us. And honestly, as you live life, it's very difficult to live your life and not run into the evidence constantly, constantly that God gave us life and He created. Paul will talk about this in the book of Romans, right? Spends a lot of time talking about, you know, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing the glory of God that is portrayed and is out there. And you can be blind to it, but, it, but it's there and it, 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 it preaches a message to us about who God is. But Paul also says in Romans in the first chapter, he says, but the problem with mankind is we want to be smart. We want to be wise. We want to be intellectual. We want to say we have knowledge. We want to be able to say, man, I've got information. I can find things. I can, do. yeah, that, that's part of who we are. We've got to be careful, though, that that desire doesn't make us somehow proud, so proud that, that we miss who God is. And so Paul was saying in Romans, right? He says, so believing themselves, speaking of mankind in general, believing themselves to be wise they became what? Fools. Yeah. I know it's harsh, but, it, but it's true. Because sometimes when, if we lift ourselves up, who we are so high, we actually become foolish because it blinds us to the God who gave us life, and it blinds us from the, from the idea that maybe we should approach that God, understand who He is, why He created us, what His plans are. Because He's bigger and more important than we are. He says in verse 28, for in him we live, we move, we exist. And some of your own poets, back to the Athenians, have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked, as I said, Paul's going to be truthful. He's going to be, you know, you got to, you got to have, if you're going to be compassionate, you've also got to be willing to confront some things. He says, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and to turn to him. That the idea of repent means you, you've got to give up the old idea and look back to the God that is true and that is real because that's the only place you're going to find your strength and your satisfaction um, in life. He says, uh, verse 31, For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is, Say this part with me, by doing what? By raising him from the dead. Of course, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. So he's, he's not like any other man that ever came. And he proved this because Jesus walked out of the grave. 
He's crucified. He is buried. Just to let you know, a, a fact that is undisputed in any credible historical or archaeological sense. There's no one that disputes this fact. The only people that do are, are like the ones who say, but I don't care about the evidence. I'm, you know. So Jesus Christ crucified and buried 2,000 years ago. But as Paul would say, but some saw him rise from the grave. And he goes through in Corinthians a whole list of, you can go talk to them now. They'll still tell you, you know, he, was, he rose and we saw him afterwards. And the list is huge. And it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ that proved that God cares, he loves us, that God had a plan, and that that plan goes through uh, Jesus Christ himself. And then in verse 32, he goes on and says, when they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. Yep. But others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And uh, of course, these were Greeks that uh, became believers and began to follow him. So I thought I'd just put a little summary in there. Um, how can you engage someone who is not like you? Or maybe, let me put it this way, because I think there's a, even a better way to say this. How can you engage people in a world that you don't like? That may be even more true, right? Because there's, there's a lot of the world as Paul looks at these idols and says, I don't like that. That really bothers me. Okay, so how do you engage a world that you might not like some things about the world that you look around and see? Let me give you just five things real quickly. First of all, you have to engage it with humility, and that's what you see with Paul. You, you cannot engage the world with arrogance or pride or I'm smarter than everybody because to do that as a Christian, it goes against what you actually believe. <laughs> We do not believe that we're smarter than everybody else. We do not believe that we know the answer to everything. It, it's about who God is, and it's about who Jesus Christ is. And to do this by, by, by coming with, with humility, what we're doing is we're acknowledging to other people, which is very disarming, that, listen, I'm a lot more like you than I am not like you. I am. And for Paul to do this and have Greek believers they're a lot more like us than not like us. Even the book of Acts is, is written down. The writer is Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. He was not Jewish. He, he was a Gentile. He was a physician. And he wrote it down because he wanted to make sure that it was written so it would not be lost back in that you know, time period right after Jesus himself was crucified and raise the dim. So the first, first step, you know, humility, because humility pulls us together. And humility humanizes all people where it'd be easy um, for us and, you know, to take something like this and treat people in a way that is dehumanizing. In other words, criticize because I can criticize on this and I don't have to face you or talk to you and, and go after people and do damage Paul would say, no, a you know, better way would be to engage people you know, in real life, and then uh, all of a sudden you realize how much we are alike. Second thing is, look for acceptable common ground. Because there is common ground in our life, because we're alike. Uh, there is even the idea, like I said, that we seek the same thing, even though we don't necessarily know it. We're, we're not sure sometimes what we're seeking. But as people, we seek the same things. I would say this, three, focus on the why. We tend to get caught up on the uh, how and the what and the mechanics of it, and, and we forget the, the, the reason we do this and the reason we present who God is and the reason He becomes our strength through all sorts of change and all sorts of difficulties in life. Fourth thing is, I would say, build on what God has done and His accessibility. Because what Paul is doing is he's not building this on himself, you need to be like me. And like I said, I'm smarter than you are, better you. That was Paul's former life. That's how he did it. But now he, he does something very different. He, he lifts up who God is, the character of God, and what God has done. And the fact that God has made himself accessible for all people uh, who would believe and follow him. 
And then finally, the, the, the last thing is I would say strive to become more of a worshiper in life of God and less of a critic. A worshiper of God and less of a critic of the world. Because our criticism of the world doesn't change the world. In fact, so many times when we criticize the world, we're only criticizing ourselves because we are a lot more alike people than we are different. But if we worship God, we, we bring forth an answer, someone who can make changes, someone who created us. And the reality of us, think about it, someone who loves us so much more than we know how to love one another. So much more. Because as Paul would later say, while we were yet sinners, that would mean we were separated from God, cast out from God, Christ died for us so that we could be brought back to God. He didn't do it because we repented or we fixed things or we, or we changed our ways. He did it so that we would repent and try to repair some things and fix our relationships and fix our ways. Not because we are so righteous or so perfect, but because we were so needy that He gave us what we really needed in His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. And um, as, as we do pray, um, I'm, my hope is that the Scripture and the approach of, of Paul challenges you um, and that you would look to God even now and say, God, rather than me figure out the way and the way I think it should be and, and me to get caught up in the things that I don't like about the world, because there are a lot of things I don't like about the world. Father, would you, would you teach me and show me, give me a different approach, built on a, a, a different foundation, the strength of who you are in my life. Strengthened of, of, of like the Stoics thought, the, a, a greater purpose. And it really is there because you have a plan and you have a purpose. And the satisfaction that the Epicureans were, were looking for, it, it can be found in you. So if you're here and you've never put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, he still is the key. He's, he's the whole hinging point of history. He changed everything. When Jesus came and lived a perfect life, suffering every temptation, every struggle that you and I would suffer through so that we know he understands us, and yet sinless, so that he could offer his life in exchange for us. He could take our sins upon himself so that he could give us his righteousness, his standing with the Father. That's why we worship him. That's why we say it is the risen Christ who changed everything for us. Lord Jesus, come live in our hearts. Forgive us of our sins. Teach us your way, the most powerful powerful way of all as you change hearts and lives in Jesus name. Amen.